Part 1, Introduction. Chapter 1, Elemental Accessibility. What makes for a good transport system? Most people answer that question by talking about moving people and goods between point A and point B. If moving people and goods is the goal, then improving transport typically means increasing performance measures such as road speed and capacity, or what we call increasing mobility. But is that really our goal? In most situations, the answer is no. The underlying goal of transport is instead about getting people to activities and opportunities like work, school, shopping, restaurants, medical care, parks, concerts, and getting goods to market, or what we call accessibility. Accessibility, as we mean it, measures the ease of reaching destinations. We define it more formally as the mathematical product of the number and quality of destinations that can be reached, and the general cost combining time, money, and other factors of reaching them. More specifically, a cumulative opportunities accessibility measure evaluates the number of destinations that can be reached in a given time threshold. For instance, Figure 1.1 shows accessibility in the contiguous United States by car at 8 a.m. on Wednesdays in 2015 using GPS traffic speed data and employment data for every census block, with jobs as the destination and 30 minutes as the threshold. Places where more jobs can be reached in 30 minutes are darker red, or even purple in some large cities. Places with few jobs are light blue. In a sense, this is taking the 30-minute isochrone, summing the jobs in the isochrone, and doing this for all 11 million census blocks. Jobs are not the only important destinations, so accessibility can be computed for different places as well as for different modes, on different days, in different years. If computed consistently with a cumulative opportunities measure, accessibility can be compared and can help explain observations that land values and productivity are higher where access is higher and travel times are lower. Transit mode share is higher where transit accessibility is relatively closer to auto accessibility. Since one aim of transport is connecting people with places rather than simply moving quickly, accessibility, which considers both mobility and land development patterns, is far more valuable than many performance metrics traditionally used by state and local departments of transport. The map of Figure 1.2 compares the area accessible by transit in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region. If we are looking for a place to live, these maps tell us where we might be able to work, shop, and seek entertainment via transit. Transport is also about connecting people with people. Thus, accessibility maps can tell us about our potential dating pool. If we are locating a business, maps like these can shed light on the geography from which we might be able to attract employees or customers. This isn't to say that St. Paul would be a poor choice for locating a business compared with Minneapolis. The point is that understanding accessibility can inform our decision making and help identify the trade-offs when locating our businesses and our homes. Accessibility is about more than accessing destinations. It brings us freedom, independence, and opportunity. Elements of Access takes the core of these accessibility calculations, some of the fundamental ideas in transport, and examines them in depth. Which destinations? Why certain thresholds? What travel times? For example, seemingly simple concepts such as travel time have different meanings at different scales. The traffic engineer measures speeds on links, but this is only part of the story. It needs to be coupled with an understanding of human reactions, such as induced demand, that can offset our expected gains. It needs to consider the perspective of the network planner, who considers the topology and directness of the network. There are many other interrelated questions, but we can only find the broader solution we seek when we first understand the fundamentals this book presents and then ask the right questions. 1.1 Isochrone. Travel times increase with distance. Figure 1.3 from Melbourne, Australia, circa 1925, shows how travel times increase for the local public transport network in what is formally called an isochrone. Iso meaning same, chrone meaning time. Areas that are near in can reach the center quickly. Areas far from the center take longer. Transport networks distort the uniformity of this arrangement by increasing speeds in selected corridors. Even then, stations farther away take longer and people who live farther from stations take more time than those who are adjacent to stations because of access costs. This map was obviously drawn by hand and simplifies by assuming people can walk in straight line from their home to the station. If they are walking along a grid of streets, those circles around the stops would be much more diamond-like. 1.2. Rings of Opportunity there are numerous measures of accessibility, some of which are more complicated than others. The simplest, a binary measure of access, asks, is A directly connected to B? 
The answer is either yes or no, one or zero. We can look a bit deeper. Can A reach B on the network or graph, even if it has to pass through C, D, or E? The answer is still a yes or no, but is now more likely to be yes. You can solve the second if you know the first, since if A is connected to C, and C is connected to D, and D is connected to E, E is connected to B, then we deduce A can reach B. The cumulative opportunities measure asks, can A reach B within a given time threshold? This is slightly more sophisticated, but can still be directly measured if we now weight our network graph for the travel cost on each link. The travel cost typically means travel time, but it can be a more general cost that combines time and money and other factors. First we ask, is the time on link AC plus the time on link CD plus the time on link DE plus the time on link EB less than the time threshold T? Then we sum it up, at each origin, for all destinations of interest. The destinations of interest might be jobs, grocery stores, schools, or airports. This is illustrated in figure 1.4. In this case, there are three measures of accessibility, one at a 10-minute isochrone, one at 20, and the last at 30. We add up the number of dots in each ring, and that is the cumulative opportunity measure for that time threshold for the origin. Clearly, accessibility varies by location, by time of day, by day of week, by season, by purpose of trip, by type of destinations of interest, by mode of travel, and by individual, among other things. But even basic accessibility metrics like cumulative opportunity provide strong explanations for house values, wages, and travel behavior. 1.3, Metropolitan Average Accessibility. Often detailed geographic land use or network information is not available, especially if one wants to look backward in time. Metropolitan accessibility can be approximated using a variant of the classic formula of the area of a circle, A equals pi r squared. Typically, when we think of the area of a circle, we think of a radius as a distance. But in accessibility, the relevant question is a time radius, in minutes which measures how far you can travel in a given unit of time. So we need to convert this time into a distance, which depends on the speed of the network and its circuity, both of which vary for each origin destination pair. Accessibility is also not a simple area, but rather a number of opportunities, say jobs, so the area is multiplied by the employment density in that area. For metropolitan areas, this macroscopic accessibility measure tends to underestimate accessibility at long time thresholds and overestimate accessibility for short thresholds compared to a more microscopic, geographically accurate analysis. This bias is because average speeds are too high for short trips and too low for long trips, and because this measure ignores job opportunities outside the finite boundary of the metropolitan area. The measures are comparable at a time threshold just above 30 minutes.